Hey, hey guys, Adam here with another educational video. In this video, we shall explore the mysteries of laminar flow, its advantages and disadvantages, and how much it affected the performance of the P51 Mustang. This will be a pretty technical video, but I think I did a good job of breaking it down into digestible sections. Without further ado, let's flow right into it. There are a few types of drag. The one we're interested in today is parasite drag, which is divided into two categories, pressure drag and skin friction drag. Pressure drag comes from the difference between the higher pressure at the front of the object and the lower pressure at the back of the object, pretty intuitive. Skin friction drag is a bit more difficult to visualize. Imagine you're spreading honey on bread. You'll need to exert force on the knife to adequately spread the honey, and that's because the honey's high viscosity makes its molecules stick to the knife, and as they slide across the knife and onto the bread, it exerts a force on the knife, slowing it down and forcing you to exert an equal force to keep going. The same thing happens in the air, except that the air's viscosity is much lower than honey's, so it's not often noticeable to humans. However, aircraft have a lot of surface area that is exposed to air and they move at high speed, making skin friction drag a big component of drag for aircraft. For blunt bodies, pressure drag is the main component of parasite drag, while for slender bodies like wings and well-designed aircraft, skin friction drag is the main component of parasite drag. That leads me to talk about a misunderstood concept regarding radial engines. We've all heard that the radial engine has a higher frontal area than a similar power inline engine, and that's what makes them draggier than inlines. When people hear that, I think they imagine the extra pressure drag at the front of the aircraft in the case of the radial engine. There's certainly an increase in pressure drag, but the increase in frontal area also induces another change, which is that the fuselage will be bigger to house the bigger engine. Increasing the size of the fuselage and hence its surface that is in contact with the airflow increases skin friction drag as well. If you try to cut down on the fuselage length to compensate for that like on the J2Ms, then in that case pressure drag increases significantly. For a well-designed radial engine however, skin friction drag is still the main component of parasite drag. To understand skin friction drag, we must first understand the boundary layer and what happens inside the boundary layer. Boundary layers are created whenever a fluid comes into contact with an object, in this case a flat plate. Inside this boundary layer, which is typically a few centimeters thick, the air is moving slower than outside of it, going from zero speed as the air sticks to the wall of the plate, and gradually increasing its speed as it gets further away from the wall until it goes back to its maximum speed at the end of the boundary layer. Skin friction drag is proportional to how quickly speed increases as you move away from the wall. It's basically a measure of how much the air rubs against the wall, just like how the honey rubs against the knife, creating skin friction drag. Finally, we can begin to talk about laminar flow. Laminar flow is characterized by neatly flowing fluid streams which don't cross each other. That's what you see on the left side of the image at the beginning of the flat plate. In contrast, as the name implies, turbulent flow is characterized by chaotic eddies. Why does it matter whether the flow is laminar or turbulent? It affects how quickly speed increases as you move away from the wall, and that's proportional to skin friction drag as stated previously. For laminar flow, speed increases slower at the wall than for turbulent flow, leading to significantly less tugging at the wall, leading to less skin friction drag. One thing to keep in mind is that laminar flow is fragile. It can easily be tripped into going turbulent. In fact, for aircraft big enough to carry humans at decent speeds, it's not possible to have laminar flow over the entire wing, and the flow will transition to turbulent after traveling a certain portion of the wing, which we call the transition point. What's special about laminar flow airfoils, like on the Piff 2 Mustang, is that it aims to keep laminar flow over approximately 40% of the cord, compared to a typical 5% of the cord. It achieves this by having its maximum thickness further back from the front of the airfoil at around 45% of the cord, compared to the typical 30% like on the P47. To put it simply, a more gradual increase in airfoil thickness will favor laminar flow over turbulent flow. That's not the only thing required for laminar flow, but we'll talk about that later. Now, with the equations circled in blue and red for laminar and turbulent flow respectively, 
We can calculate the skin friction drag for a laminar flow airfoil and compare it to a typical airfoil by approximating the airfoil as a flat plate. The equations are based on the Reynolds number, which is a convenient number that takes everything I said into account for the calculations, such as viscosity, speed, and cord position. By separating the 2 meter average cord of the P51 into 200 small sections, and by calculating the skin friction coefficient for every section, we get the skin friction coefficient as a function of cord graph for the typical airfoil. We notice the transition from laminar to turbulent flow by the sudden increase in skin friction coefficient at 5% of the cord, which is 0.1 meters on this graph. Let's plot the same type of graph for the laminar flow airfoil and overlay it to see what we get. We notice that the skin friction is the same for the first 5% of the graph because both are laminar. Then, the typical airfoil sees a big increase in skin friction coefficient, while the laminar airfoil continues to decrease. That's when the typical airfoil transitions to turbulent flow. At 40% of the cord, the laminar airfoil transitions to turbulent flow, and both have the same skin friction until the end of the wing. The average skin friction coefficient gives the drag coefficient of the wing, so by comparing the area under the curve, we compare the drag coefficient of both airfoils. At first glance, the laminar flow saves about a third of the drag of the typical airfoil because of the lower drag between 5 and 40% of the cord, and indeed the calculations show that the laminar airfoil has a 34% lower drag coefficient than the typical airfoil, which is significant. Let's take a small break from laminar flow and go on an interesting tangent. How thick does the boundary layer get? On this graph, which is zoomed in 100 times in the vertical axis, you see that it gets to around 3 centimeters. To scale, it would look like this. Any object, not just wings, that is exposed to an airflow will see the creation of a boundary layer of slower moving and turbulent air on it. That's why, as some people have noticed, there is usually a small gap between the intake of a radiator or engine and the fuselage it is connected to. Here are just a few examples. This is to prevent the ingestion of slower and turbulent air in a radiator or engine intake, which would hurt the performance of that component. Laminar flow requires more than just a special type of airfoil. Small defects like paint bumps, rivets, and squashed bugs will chip the laminar flow into becoming turbulent earlier, destroying the benefit of a laminar flow wing. The wind tunnel tests show that they could obtain laminar flow in clean conditions. However, due to the rigors associated with war, I don't think the P-51 managed nearly as much laminar flow in practice. But for the sake of argument, let's see how much laminar flow would change the performance of the aircraft. First, let's remo remove the parts of the wing where we know there won't be laminar flow. The part of the wing directly behind the propeller is subject to prop wash, which is higher speed, spinning, and turbulent flow, which prevents laminar flow on that portion of the wing. Then, we have the gun ports with the associated protrusions, which makes laminar flow doubtful directly behind the gun ports. Optimistically, we're left with 50% of the wing area that can benefit from laminar flow. So instead of reducing wing drag by 34%, it'll be reduced by 17%. Since the wing drag is about 44% of the total zero-lift drag of the Mustang, the effect of laminar flow on the aircraft as a whole is a 7.5% reduction in zero-lift drag. It sounds small for the best-case scenario, but the reduction in drag increases the aircraft's top speed at sea level by 17 claws per hour compared to a typical airfoil. One thing laminar flow does not help with is in high-speed turning. I'm not sure where that myth came from. Turning is just not related to laminar flow. The drawbacks of laminar flow airfoils are the tight production and assembly tolerances, more maintenance in the field to preserve the pristine conditions necessary for laminar flow, and typically a lower maximum lift coefficient and worse stall characteristics. The benefits of laminar flow airfoils certainly exist, but the increase in speed and size of aircraft make it very difficult to conserve laminar flow over a significant portion of the aircraft. Turbulent flow has its advantages as well. Commercial airliners even have vortex generators to make sure they have turbulent flow during takeoff and landing to delay the stall. Dimples on a golf ball serve a similar function by transitioning to turbulent flow earlier, 
and turbulent flow stays attached to the golf ball for longer, significantly reducing pressure drag, which has a much bigger effect than the slightly increasing skin friction drag. It's why golf balls have regulations concerning the size and number of dimples on it. The only aircraft I know of in service that uses laminar flow is the Honda Jet, so the use of laminar flow airfoils hasn't completely disappeared since the 1940s. All in all, the Mustang is still a low drag aircraft, but it's not because of its laminar flow airfoil. It's due to the combination of a low drag airfoil, aerodynamic fuselage, efficient radiator, and high quality production which reduces surface roughness and drag. And that concludes the video. I hope you learned something in this video and feel free to suggest technical topics you would like me to cover in future videos. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more, and see ya squared.